Uh, hi, welcome to the uh, July 15 North America meeting of the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group. Um, this meeting operates under the uh, Code of Conduct of the Kubernetes Project. Uh, summary of that is just to be nice to people. Um, the uh, co-chair of the group, um, Dion from Red Hat, told me that he wouldn't be able to be present today, but uh, we'll do the best we can without him. Um, when I looked this morning, no one had put any suggestions on the agenda, but as usual, um, any group members, attendees are welcome to put things in at the last minute, or uh, we've had meetings before when nothing started out, but ended up uh, getting some fascinating discussions. Uh, I posted in the chat a link to the meeting agenda notes document, so I'd invite people to add their name to the attendees list. Um, and if we've got any first time attendees, maybe we'll go through a round of introductions. Um, there are a few people here who I'm not sure aren't regulars, although maybe you've been here once or twice. Uh, jump in if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay. Um, Greg? My, yeah, my name's uh, Greg Waynes. I'm, uh, I work in the uh, Starling, OpenStack Starling X uh, team. And uh, Starling X is, is a project within OpenStack that deploys um, uh, it deploys a Kubernetes cluster as well as the containerized uh, OpenStack cloud on top of that Kubernetes cluster. And we, um, uh, I think, I think I might have joined you when uh, uh, Ildico joined as well. Okay. Uh, to talk about the uh, OSPF Edge uh -huh. group or something. And uh, anyway, we, uh, I'm just interested in this group because Starling X has a kind of distributed cloud type uh, deployment configuration where it has a central cloud and geographically distributed sub clouds and at the edge and just interested to see what works going on here that, you know, perhaps we could leverage in Starling X. Okay. Uh, when you say central cloud geographically distributed, that means central in the context of OpenStack or in Kubernetes as well? Uh, no, in Kubernetes as well. So uh, like at our lowest l level, like OpenStack is sort of just an application for us. So mm -hmm. at, at the base where we basically manage a Kubernetes on bare metal uh, on dedicated servers. And so, um, so yeah, so when I say central cloud, it's a it's a full Kubernetes cluster, like uh, masters and workers. Uh -huh. And then, and then the, the sub clouds also have masters and workers so that they can be mainly because, so that they can be autonomous if they lose connectivity to the central cloud. Okay. So it's like a solution that, that would it be fair to say it federates uh, these other ones by running one instance of a central controller and then other independent ones under the management of that? Yes, exactly. Okay. Like the central cloud is primarily used for orchestration purposes, like or federation purposes across the, the sub clouds. Um, right now, the orchestration is, is more around being able to do sort of uh, um, you know, easy kind of one touch uh, sub cloud install, installs, as well as uh, you know, monitoring kind of uh, alarms and uh, collecting, uh, you know, Kubernetes events through Elastic uh, and that sort of thing, so. Uh -huh. Okay, great. I think that is definitely something that uh, members of this group would be interested in. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you, since we had an open agenda, you, you're welcome if you're prepared to do it, to go into uh, a description of it in more detail, or maybe we can put you on the agenda for a future meeting if you'd rather have a little more time. But that sounds yeah, interesting. Actually, yeah, I wouldn't mind getting on the agenda for a future meeting. Um, okay. And I can, yeah, maybe prepare something a little better to uh, to go over. But uh, but yeah, I like, I'm, like, do you guys talk much about Cube Fed or? 
Well, you know, there's, it's interesting. Other members are welcome to join in because I don't think that there's a consensus on what the recommendation or current state is here. But I'm aware of projects that have gone with a um, philosophy of doing a central cloud hosted Kubernetes that manages cluster nodes out at edge locations. So it's essentially one, one instance of Kubernetes that has geographically scattered um, worker nodes. Now the other philosophy is to put down a central control plane which is hosted by an instance of Kubernetes, have other instances of Kubernetes out at each edge location and then uh, use federation or I think within the Kubernetes project, there's a SIG called multi-cluster and uh, come up with a mechanism to implement policy-based management that could be applied across multiple Kubernetes clusters by an overarching uh, control plane. So I don't believe there's a consensus of which of those two is, and maybe there never will be because, you know, use cases vary. So there's potentially room for both solutions to exist. Uh, so yeah, we had know, the, does that answer yeah, your the, question? Yeah, uh, I mean, we had the same discussion in uh, like Gildico's team around, you know, whether it's one cluster or multiple clusters. And, uh, and we arrived at the same conclusion is that different use cases will demand different uh, kind of architectures. So, so we kind of promote both. Um, I know just within Starling X, we're definitely the multi-cluster scenario. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, but yeah, I think I actually attend the multi-cluster SIG group as well. Like that's where they would talk more in depth about KubeFed. Is that, that the understanding? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know, you know, the multi-cluster uh, from my perspective, but I don't regularly go to those meetings, but I, I maybe catch a few a year. I think that most of the ones that I've caught are more towards traditional large IT federation, you know, like uh, multiple data centers, multiple clusters in public clouds, and not so much device edge and these kind of smaller things that historically have been most of the attendees to the meetings of this working group. So there, I, I think that, you know, there, the cluster federation or multi-cluster maybe would be done differently when your clusters are all very large and have a lot of resources to the point where you can really uh, take advantage of the elastic scalability. Whereas in some edge deployments, you might aspire to having enough backing hardware resource to really claim you're scalable. But the reality is that there isn't much there to let that take place. So there's yeah, even like I a, I, I'd say there's even a third mechanism to approach this, which is out at the edge, they are not Kubernetes cluster nodes at all. They're simply some sort of compute resource that you would use the Kubernetes control plane with CRD injection to manage these things, even if they're not traditional Kubernetes worker nodes. So I joined kind of a couple of minutes late. Greg, uh, can you help us understand what's the reason you want to enable this scenario? Like you want to have a unified control plane on the cloud managing multiple cluster? Like what uh, Steve mentioned, mostly. Yeah, what, by the way, the... Cindy, Greg is new here. So maybe you want to even introduce yourself. Cindy is a co-chair oh, yeah. of this group and she's with uh, Microsoft. So I'm Cindy Xing. Currently, I'm working at Microsoft, uh, focusing on uh, Azure IoT Edge. I, uh, I, I've been actively involved in the Kubernetes Edge computing group in this one. I, I, uh, I was also working on the Cube Edge project as well. So we'd like to understand what uh, customer scenario you want to enable. Well, actually, the, the use case, um, the, the use case that we've mostly been working in is um, like a telecom use case where they're, um, you know, trying to push their 
cloud uh, applications out closer to the edge for, you know, all the normal reasons of latency and uh, for the new style apps that they're doing and stuff like that. And uh, um, and some of these remote places are um, in, uh, in places where the network connectivity isn't super reliable. So they have the requirement that, um, that you know, the connectivity between the central cloud where they want to do orchestration and management of what's going on on the remote nodes, they, um, because the connectivity isn't reliable, they, uh, um, they want like a, they want the edge nodes to be autonomous in the sense that if they lose connectivity to the, um, central cloud, they, they don't lose any functionality. They can still, you know, recover from container failures. They can still, um, you know, have full functionality with respect to, uh, uh, their their application. So that, that that's our kind of high level context of the use case. And uh, okay. and like I say, it's it's like a it's it's typically telecom users that are are looking at uh, like I mentioned maybe before you came that I work in the Starling X uh, OpenStack Starling X project, and most of the users of that are looking at that project. Um, uh, are are looking for that autonomous autonomous behavior at the edge, but with centralized orchestration. Okay, I see. Uh, so I think so far we saw two uh, two kinds of autonomy or two patterns of design patterns of autonomy. One is uh, like you can run a Kubernetes cluster on edge uh, and uh, achieving autonomy. The second one is the pattern like a cube edge uh, design where like a, you can run your edge node, uh, a node on edge by caching the metadata on edge, you achieve an autonomy as well. So the reason I'm asking the multi-cluster uh, support is like, are you running multiple clusters on the edge so that you want to have a control plane in the cloud? Yeah, like we, we rightly or wrongly uh you know two or three years ago we decided to go down the path of running a full cluster at the edge so full mm -hmm. control plane and and one advantage starling x has is that we can scale pretty small right like uh um we have all-in-one nodes that uh, you know run both master and worker functionality and and we can sit on a small, like super micro, single socket, the eight core system and, and have a decent number of containers running on, on that and not use much, and not use much like other than like one core for the platform. So leave seven cores for, for the hosted applications. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, that was kind of one of the, the, some of the reasoning behind, you know, yeah, you know, we went down the okay. We'll do uh, we'll do full control plane, full clusters at the edge, and they might be really small. They could grow big. Uh, cur our current users are using tons of really small subclouds. Okay, I see. So, uh, so you're saying you have several small Kubernetes clusters on the edge, and you want to. Uh, centrally manage them from the cloud, right? From the central cloud, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I see. I, I think like, a, uh, like what we talked earlier, the, the Kubernetes multi-cluster can be a solution, but I also know like for, if you only want, do you want like a cross-cluster microservice communication each other? Or like, they work independently. Um, like uh, like between two subclouds have communication. Yes. I could see that that would be a requirement of the applications that we're hosting. Okay. Um, uh, I know. Like uh, nowadays, you still support uh, cross cluster communication 
for service mesh. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. So if you don't need a, a central control plane, actually you can use leverage is still to enable uh, like a cross cluster communication on the edge. That's my assumption. You could do that. You mean do cross cluster communication rather than having the central cloud? Yeah. Yeah, I mean and that's that, an option. That depends on like whether you want to do the support the control plane or not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's an option. I know. Just generally operationally, it seems nice to have the central cloud because all the installs of the sub clouds are done from the central cloud. It's kind of a, you know, single point, single pane of glass for, you know, seeing an overview of, uh, uh, you know, the state of all the sub clouds that are dispersed. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there is some advantage with having the central cloud. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I, I think yeah, that the, the overhead, the control plane overhead by having a, a multi-cluster like a cloud federation control plane is the overhead. The second is about the synchronization because the, as you, you're saying, the network re reliability issue between the edge control plane with the central control plane there can be like synchronization uh, problem. How would you ensure, uh, you, yeah, that that can that needs to be addressed. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I, I think that could be a, one of the reason why Steve was saying for the multi-cluster in data center, you could have multiple clusters assuming the network uh, reliability is still there, but, and then you can manage multiple clusters. Here, you have multiple clusters, and then some of them can be connect, disconnected. For right. while. Then how can you ensure your federation in the cloud is still uh, reasonable or like, because you do scheduling the, the resources, the the workload status may not be true, right? Right. So what are the, like, uh, actually, maybe uh, I was mixing up the two groups of, you know, the multi-cluster SIG group and your, this group, the, which is more IoT and edge. Like what are, what are typically the type of uh, topics that, that your group is uh, looking at with respect to you know Kubernetes at the edge. Well, I'll jump here and answer it. I I think that it it's tough to pigeonhole because we've even done polls of uh, the people attending this group, both in the <laughs> meetings here and at the physical meetings at KubeCon conferences, and they divide into use cases from telco device IoT. Uh, retail IoT, which would be standing up things to host containerized workloads in retail stores that could range from sandwich shops up to very large stores that might have a rack of equipment. Um, and it's so varied that it's really tough to classify. Uh, we haven't attempted to restrict the scope of this group. It's just uh, running Kubernetes at edge or using Kubernetes to manage things at edge that aren't Kubernetes are both within the scope of this group. And I think we get factions that are interested in both those categories. Yeah, I think, I, I think, um, you know, ignoring the distributed cloud stuff for now, we're in Starling X, we're interested in a lot of those same topics just because our sub clouds are at the edge, right? Mm -hmm. That we're, we're very interested in, you know, deploying Kubernetes at the edge or managing Kubernetes things or, or, or like Kubernetes yeah. devices, like a, like a small Raspberry Pi or something like that. Like we did a demo uh, about a year ago um, where we, you know, just used our Starling X um, all in one server on a little super micro and it was, you know, managing, uh, um, 
uh, a number of Kubernetes or a number of uh, Raspberry Pis running uh, as, as simple Kubernetes, and uh, and just just as a okay, if I if I had devices that were a little bigger and could run Kubernetes like a Raspberry Pi, then I could tie them into my cloud, my Starling X cloud, which has you know services like mm-hmm. you know it's got a registry, it's got a a Ceph storage backend for PVCs and stuff like that. So it's got a lot of services that could offer these small Kubernetes devices. But at the mm-hmm. same time, I, we also are interested in in what services we can provide to non Kubernetes devices um, from, you know, the small Kubernetes subcloud. Right. Let me make this suggestion there. People have put a couple more things on the agenda. So as moderator, I'm going to time box this. Yeah, uh, sure. But sure. I do encourage you if you want to give a prepared presentation overview of Starling X and how it would relate to Kubernetes at edge, uh, please do at a, the future meeting of your choice. We've got two different uh, time series going on. So this one repeats every four weeks for North America. And there's one at an alternate time for Eastern Europe, uh, Asia. Uh, And that repeats every four weeks. But between the two of them, we have a meeting every two weeks. So you're welcome to choose either one of those and put yourself on the agenda. Uh, Okay. So with that said, does anybody else in the group have any parting comments or observations they want to make with regard to the topic Greg brought up? I would just say, uh, uh, hey, this is, this is uh, Kilton here. I would just say that uh, thematically, um, it's very similar to what just about you know, every architecture needs to be everywhere. The approach is the thing that uh, depends on, you know, what your backend system is and so on. So I think when you present, it will give uh, some more insight into what, what things you like to hold steady and what things you're willing to vary at the edge. And I think that'll allow the group to, to give you some further suggestions. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and then the other thing I'd suggest, if you can put this in your deck, and maybe this even segues, I noticed somebody put on the agenda uh, opinions about Project Eve, which if I understand it correctly, would be something that goes down more towards the hardware layer. But if you could address on your Starling X, what the actual process and uh, day-to-day management and maintenance experience would be with getting Starling X actually deployed out at edge locations, if that's what you propose that it's suited for. But uh, yeah, we I, actually, I'd, we I'd actually encourage done. you to put that in your presentation because I think people would be interested in that. Yeah, okay, for sure. Like we've actually done some really cool uh, recent work on you know leveraging Redfish virtual media controllers and really got a one button, one button way to fully uh, install and deploy a subplan. Yeah, because this group actually does tend to get focused all the way down to the, you know, to the hardware level. So that that would be of interest, I think. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the next thing on the agenda, the Cube Edge uh, due diligence for incubation. Uh, Ian, would you like to make some remarks? Uh, yeah, that's the uh, due diligence. Now it's, uh, that's for Cube Edge application for uh, incubation is now in the public comment phase. So yeah, so if you are interested, could you just go there and take a look if you have questions or just show the support? Yep, that's about it. Thank you. Yeah, and for those who might not know, CubeEdge is a distribution of Kubernetes. You can correct me if I'm misdescribing it in some way or you can do better than I can, but It's a distribution of Kubernetes tailored for edge applications. It has been in the CNCF sandbox for what, a a year or more? Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's entered the sandbox when Cindy is still here. It's uh, in uh, March, 2019. The Uh thing is, I I don't think that's a distribution. It's just extension. Okay. So we, we are not going to replace Kubernetes, just extend the Kubernetes ability to the edge. So uh-huh. a little correction. Yeah, we'll put the uh, GitHub pull request there too. So if you are interested, you can take a look. 
Yeah, and then uh, what's what this is about is the CNCF uh, has a process whereby they adopt projects at different life cycle phases. So many projects go in in at the sandbox level, and uh, you know it implies you know that they're very early stage. Uh, the CNCF itself has a description of the different categories, but uh, projects typically aspire to move up as they build a contributor base. So things at the sandbox can be accepted when they are just getting started, don't have huge numbers of contributors or users, but still want to get a foundation hosting them to try to build that kind of momentum. And there's a procedure whereby you can document the health and the community health of your project uh, to move up into higher stages of uh, uh, support within the CNCF uh, uh, foundation. So CubeEdge is um, applying to do that. So people familiar with it are welcome to, uh, it, you know, to, to actually do the graduation, it's the uh, TOC committee in the CNCF who has to vote and approve that, but they do solicit feedback from uh, members out in the community. So people who have an opinion on this are, are welcome to make public that opinion to help guide the TOC. Uh, if somebody wanted to make a comment, Yin, where do you recommend they do it? I think you're allowed to do it either in a mailing list or in the GitHub itself. And I don't know if you have a preferred place for that. Yeah, I think usually people just comment in the GitHub. So okay. that is a permanent record and automatically inform everybody involved in this PR. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's usually people do. Okay. Okay, any, any other comments? Uh, on CubeEdge before I move on to the next item in the agenda? Yeah, okay. I'm a, personally, I'm a, a big advocator for this design pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next, I'm not sure who put it in the agenda, but somebody put a line uh, wanting to have, um, wanting to know about opinions about Project Eve. And whoever did that, maybe you can, um, if you have a microphone, maybe you can give a brief description of what Project Eve is and about. Or maybe if you don't know, I can take a shot at it. <laughs> yeah, well, that, uh, that would be me. Uh, okay. So for those who are not necessarily familiar with the group, uh, hello. I'm uh, Frédéric, I'm uh, working at the Eclipse Foundation and I manage uh, IoT and edge computing programs over there. And if you didn't know, we have, uh, well, this working group is a, is a joint initiative between uh, the CNCF and the Eclipse Foundation. So we are glad to uh, collaborate on that. And uh, we have our own edge computing working group, which is centered on, on the two edge computing platforms that we've got, Eclipse IO Fog and Eclipse Fog OS. Um, and as part of that, we're trying to find our place in the world uh, currently, so to speak, and uh, having a look at various things that exist in the market uh, to try to contrast and compare that to the platforms that we have in the direction that we want uh, to have over there as a, as a group. And one of the things that we want to understand better is Project Eve. I had a look at the website and uh, essentially this seems to be a kind of general purpose uh, edge computing platform the the one thing that that struck me when i when i read um, you know what's on their website is essentially that they say that um, there is a kind of open source reference controller for the platform that implements you know the apis but that the production quality ones so to speak would be found into into commercial offerings or offerings that are not necessarily part of the open source core um, and i wanted uh, to have some some perspective about that that project its level of maturity what what you think of it if you ever kick the tires on it or not i i don't have unfortunately the time to try it myself 
So I was hoping that maybe someone on the call has some perspective about it. Uh, and if not, that that's fine. You know, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll eventually uh, find a way to to evaluate it. But uh, yeah, I was curious about your your collective perspective on that particular project. Okay, has anybody actually like used it here? If not, I. I haven't, I haven't used it yet. I have been following a little bit since uh, the project was uh, announced some time ago. And um, uh, the last I um, had a, a look at the, uh, the code, it, it, um, it, it seemed that it was an edge virtualization ready uh, Linux uh, distro. Um, but um, I'm not sure if it now is, is installable on top of your own OS or it, or it is the OS still. And, and so, um, I guess the short answer is, uh, Steve, I have, I have not used it. <laughs> uh, and so I don't have an enough experience to, to be qualified to speak about that. Yeah, my reaction, it possibly it's wrong, but I, uh, I came across something. I, I don't, I think I saw it at Open Source Summit or something and saw a session on it and went and had never, hadn't heard of it. So I went and looked at up the description uh, on the web page. Let me let me post what I looked at in the chat. But I gathered that this is a um, a hypervisor plus more, and uh, that that hypervisor, if I read it correctly, is based on Zen, uh, and it has verbiage on this web page saying that they are interacting with hardware root of trust like TPM. So I gather that this is, you know, that you would start a stack where this hypervisor would be installed on the bare metal hardware, uh, but that the project uh, then talks about uh, doing remote updates of, you know, the quote is the entire software stack yeah, and, and the one thing the bootstrapping one thing, up to OSs and uh, then maybe even containerized applications from there. And and the one thing that intrigues me is that on their roadmap they say they want to support LXC and other types of containers and things like that. So I'm not sure I would qualify it as a kind of hypervisor then, or maybe it's pluggable in a way that. Anyway, the, yeah, I, I wasn't sure what to make out of it, given given what's uh, what's there. So it's uh... yeah. Let me see where if I can find the line where I ended up concluding that it was a hypervisor, but I could be wrong. And uh... and 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 the session you are referring to at Open Source Summit was it the the 2020 edition that just concluded or yes it was i i ended up missing the session but that's yeah. that's what provoked me to actually even uh make an attempt to look into what this was okay uh, in any case uh, certainly as i was presenting there i can i can maybe have a look at the session catalog and see if i can catch the recording here i'm going to paste i'm going to paste in the chat what it is I was actually referring to. Just a minute. Okay, yeah, yeah, so that's the website that I had to look at. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, you know it it um, talk. It strikes me that this plan of uh, going all the way from hardware up to containerized apps is a pretty big undertaking. Uh, uh, yeah, my, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that you're gonna end up with a wide variety of components there. And I think the bigger you get, the, the more that you really need to put in place a structure to allow a plug-in architecture where things could be swapped out. You know, like if you're going to support going from hardware to a hypervisor to an OS to containers, I would contend that I'd rather see something where the hypervisors were plug-ins so you could choose your hypervisor, where the OSs were plug-ins. So it isn't just, you know, they choose the operating system for you and you're stuck with it. 
And then finally, the container runtime should be pluggable. And that, it's nice to say that all these abstraction points are nice, but as you do that, you've taken on a, a pretty big project at that point. Oh yeah, and, believe um, me, I'm, I'm a former product manager for Cloud Foundry Bosch. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> you know, all the stem cell concept and all of that, just playing in the OS layer and trying to repackage, that is a huge nightmare. So yeah, I think your assessment is uh, right on spot there. <laughs> So when you get that big, then I become pretty skeptical because there are so many things that any one of which can go wrong and your platform isn't viable. Uh, so that historically, I think the people have managed to pull that off, but it usually ends up being something where there's a de facto commercially funded implementation of this that makes money to fund all the R&D that's required that maybe is published in an open source form um, uh, and maybe that's what this is, but, um, you know, that, it just strikes me that for this to be successful, there's a lot of moving parts here. It would take a very large community with, uh, to be successful. I think at this point they'd need to ha ha somehow enlist multiple organizations getting behind this. It, it, it's too big to be successfully driven by yeah. just one backer, I think. Yeah. And, and when you drill down a bit more in their website, uh, they, they have a page that references compatible hardware and then implementations. But right now it references just the open source controller, which it seems it's not production quality, so to speak. And then there's one commercial implementation listed by, by, by a company called Zedada or Zedida. Zedida. Uh, ever heard of those guys? Because that's not a name I recognize either. But then I'm not, yeah, a uh, uh, whole time. It's lurking in the, the back space. of my brain. Like I think I've seen it somewhere, but I couldn't tell you who it is or where it's based. Okay. Maybe somebody else in the group is more familiar with it. Looks, looks like it's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, this, in one way, this matches my perception in the sense that yes, uh, to me it appeared a huge undertaking. One and and two, uh, it didn't seem to have for the time being wide adoption or or, or even uh, brand awareness in the ecosystem, so to speak. Uh, so that's in line with my expectation. But yeah, I, I tried uh, I tried my luck here and. I don't want to eat up the rest of the meeting talking about that if uh, if nobody ever heard about it or played with it then that's perfectly fine but i'm grateful at least for 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 the perspective you provided steve yeah here is the i i'm going to put another thing in this slack slack where which is the basis for my conclusion that it was it's perhaps zen aligned and mm -hmm. uh confession of possible conflict of interest. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm employed by VMware. Um, so uh, being employed by VMware, I might favor a project that would allow hypervisor plugins, for example. I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not company aligned enough that I demand that the only hypervisor be a VMware one, but that's just not realistic these days. But uh, likewise, I don't think that uh, my personal opinion is that uh, these big stacks taking on things where the hypervisor is a component should probably be pluggable to take multiple implementations. And in furtherance of that position, I think these days you need to at least swap out hypervisors to support both x86 and ARM. Yeah. Uh, I think particularly at Edge, anybody who would ignore the reality that there are multiple CPU families is just uh, not likely to succeed, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that certainly makes sense. And I was about to joke that if you need to support multiple hypervisors, then Bosch is your best choice, isn't it? It supports <laughs> everything. <laughs> 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 and you own it now at VMware now, so that's perfect. <laughs> 
No, I think Abash is not owned by anybody. That's open source. No, so. yeah, it, yeah, it's open source. But I mean, I think the, it's whole under team, Cloud Foundry the whole Foundation. team was at Pivotal. So I guess the part, a little part of the Tenzu team, I suppose, is still working <laughs> on that. But I know that the the guys, uh, I forgot the company name, but, uh, you know, you, VMware acquired a, a company with some, some of the Kubernetes of, uh, creators, uh, I think, last oh, year or the year before. Yeah, yeah. So I know those guys weren't very big on Bosch. So <laughs> anyway. That's yeah, I don't want to turn this oh, into <laughs> Bosch is kind of off topic. and uh, Yeah, yeah I've uh, worked for Bosch for a long time. So pretty happy insight. I even uh, write a few uh, Bosch CPI and uh, releases. Oh, okay. How hard and how long it take. But I don't think that the new uh, Tendo use that, right? Steve, the, the, the new Tenzu, it's not using Bosch, right? Uh, it depends. I think parts of it are. Um, Tanzu is pretty broad at this point. I, I don't really, if you guys don't mind, I just feel bad about turning a <laughs> Kubernetes project working group into too much product related things. So I'm kind of- Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's uh, my fault there. Yeah. I don't want people it. sitting here saying, oh, Steve Wong from VMware, <laughs> in the working group was sitting there talking about a bunch of VMware stuff. So yeah, 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 absolutely. You guys and, are welcome to do it, but I'm going to sit out just because. No, no, and the blame, and the blame is, is squarely on okay. me since I, I, I brought that. So for the record, since this is recorded, you know, it's not your <laughs> fault, Steve. All right. And we can, we can go on with the, with the next topic. So I'll tell you what, for Eve, if you're interested in taking this further, it seems like what we've got are, are you know, None of us really are authorities on Eve. Uh, it could be the story of, hey, in the, the land of the blind, the one-eyed person is king. But maybe we, I should be able to reach out to somebody from Project Eve and invite them to come on and give a presentation if that's of general interest. Uh, is there, there might be some interaction here. Uh, and it would seem like if they're going up from bare metal to hypervisor to OS to container runtime, they might as well go up the next step to Kubernetes and have the orchestration level too, right? Yeah, to me, to me at least it's, uh, it's certainly uh, of interest, but if that's just me, then... Uh, well, anybody else want to second it? If you, let, let's establish if anybody else wants to hear about Project Eve here. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have uh, from the horse's mouth uh, here what's, what's okay. currently I'll I'll, I'll right take there. an action item. I'm not promising it will be in the next meeting or even two, but I'll try That's to fine. track down somebody from the project and see if they want to come on and give a presentation at a future meeting. Uh, it, it's better to get the authoritative story from them rather than a bunch of people <laughs> speculating. Yep. Absolutely. I'm kind of skeptical, you know, you run across, I don't know if anybody else has this observation, but there are just so many of these edge IoT things, like kind of, there's a lot of hype about how 5G is going to boost the, the demand for edge. And I think it's true myself, but it's resulted in pretty much every project out there tacking on a we do edge too. And <laughs> They kind of go through the wish list of, you know, checking every box like, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's at least on a roadmap to do Intel and ARM, and we're going to do device edge, gateway edge, uh, you know, and they go through this. We, we're going to support containerization. And when you drill down and look at it, there's a lot more aspirational things than real in a lot of these projects that I've taken a look at. So it's, I've, I've gotten a little skeptical on it myself. I don't know if anybody yeah. else has that same observation. Yeah, oh, I, I, I feel, I feel exactly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Frederick. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was just saying that I completely agree. And I think that's your perspective as well, Hilton. It is. I mean, so Edge is the new cloud, right? And if you remember back in the early days of cloud before anyone really had a clear definition of what differentiated a cloud system from your own data center, um, you know, that you tack cloud onto everything and, and 
what we've what we've got right now is you know well over at the eclipse foundation the reason we called our, our working group the edge native working group is is we're really trying to redesign things from the edge in for that reason because if you if you tack edge on the things uh that that previously were designed for you know high speed interconnected uh, uh data center systems you probably will be able to make the functionality go but is it really designed for the environment uh, or is it something that you've added on? There's no problem to add on stuff and start iterating. But what I'd consider to be a kind of an edge ready system is one that really has rethought the architecture from the edge in and then merges with the other stuff. And it doesn't matter if you're extending or you know whatever, all of these are viable architectures. Um, you could have an edge oriented control plane that's separate uh, as you do with Eclipse IOFOG, it's all fine. But um, really thinking through what, what your environment is like uh, takes time. And, and so there's a lot of stuff that is, uh, yeah, first, first blush edge additions. And um, I think on deployment, um, usually they find that they need to go back and rethink how some of the things work. So the primitives are just very different. Yeah. Well, that, that, you planted an interesting seed in my head, Kilton, with that remark comparing it to cloud, where I, I think you're spot on there, where I think back of the early days of cloud and every player in IT, whether they were hardware, services, software, wanted to tack cloud on in some way, <laughs> because maybe Wall Street would even reward you for being associated with it, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the reality is it came down actually surprisingly quickly to like many things in the business world, if you're not in the top three in market share, you, you don't make money. Now, granted, this is an open source group, so maybe money isn't the focus, but I think sort of the same thing applies in terms of building an, a critical mass of a community where you can't have 12 successful open source projects all getting enough resource to be doing well. It's going, <laughs> it typically kind of, aligns down to a top three or something that managed to get enough uh, community participation to make their projects healthy and viable. And uh, a lot of this edge stuff is everything out there, including a lot of legacy projects are tacking on an edge moniker in the hope that they can ride the coattails of this wave. Yeah. And uh, some of them might do that and some won't, but I think a lot of them won't. And yeah. separating these out is kind of an interesting challenge. It is challenging and, and it's hard to make sense of what is real and what is hype and what is future focused. It's like um, evolution, right? You have a, the, this is the yeah. Cambrian explosion of species and <laughs> actually um, they compete each other away. And, and the, you know, the ones that are well suited for their particular use cases gain a stronghold, right? And then they have a, a flourishing population. So, yep. Right. Now, I don't propose this group or any other group should appoint themselves kingmaker. It's more like you want to give a forum to expose these different projects and ideas and let the best ones win. So uh, happy to sit here discussing these things and give presentations and kind of let the user base sort it out. Natural evolution. <laughs> okay, well, in that... Uh, you know, with that philosophy, then I'll, I will go try to recruit somebody from Eve to give a presentation and uh, we'll allow each observer to make, draw their own conclusions as to this. Makes sense. Uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, so was that the last thing on the agenda or not? I, let, me, let me go back and open the document again. So I thought last time uh, we were saying we'll have Tina to explain the Arduino and give us an overview. Okay, let's do that then. It wasn't on the agenda, but maybe that's my fault. Uh, so okay. Tina, go ahead. We can we can work with her like next time then, yeah. Well, I still see her on the participant list. Maybe yeah. she got 
distracted by another meeting that came in during your Zoom. That happens to me sometimes. Yeah, could be. Anybody else have anything uh, they want to bring up or discuss while we wait to see if Tina will come back to talk about a crano? So I'll, I'll put something out there, uh, fishing for ideas from members. Cindy and I are destined to give a uh, talk at the online version of uh, KubeCon Europe on running applications at the edge. And it would be helpful to us if any of the rest of you have ideas for things that you might like to see covered in such a talk. Um, I'm thinking that you know, the topic of apps at edge is pretty broad. Anything from, you know, in theory, you can run whatever you can put in a container if Kubernetes is involved, but potentially we could go into uh, things like function as a service or uh, other things. So just throwing this out there for comments. Yeah, well, Steve, uh, previously you have, you have said that you would be interested in doing a little bit of digging into what, uh, you know, lambdas and, and serverless function frameworks would be viable for use on lower, lower uh, power hardware. And um, we, we, of course, there's a bazillion things out there that we could constantly be researching and talk about. So I don't think we ever got to do that in this working group. If you happen to have the time, that would, I think, be a great part of the talk, given that a lot of people have asked which ones might be worth looking at. Yeah, I think, well, Cindy's my co-presenter, and I think that would be a challenge because we've got like a week to put our time oh, together okay. at this point. <laughs> All right. And yeah. then not only that, I think we only have 35 minutes. Oh, okay. Um, um, and, but I think, uh, Kilton, uh, you brought a good, uh, good topic. Uh, we can definitely uh, shares uh, the learnings or what we can see in the open source community. I think, uh, as you know, Knative is a way for people to run serverless uh, potentially on the edge as well. And then I've seen some other ways people create their scheduler or dispatcher on the edge. Uh, yeah, we can, as usual for the previous KubeCon talk, we can definitely bring in this topic and share yeah. what's available and people can pick and choose. Cool. And maybe we could do a deeper dive in this working group going forward yes. uh, based on the list that you guys create for your talk. Yeah. Thanks, Cindy. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah. And then we can even, if needed, we can even write a white paper like what you guys did for the security. Yeah. Yeah. The other philosophy is whether you actually, you know, you could take the approach of kind of running the Lambda out at an edge device or viewing the edge device as kind of a generator of event-driven uh, data streams that perhaps would feed into a Lambda up at a gateway node, just one tier above. I think there's probably room for both of those to be of interest to some use cases. Makes sense, yep. Yeah, you know, even, even the act of putting uh, the infrastructure in place to enable these event-driven streams, whether it be MQTT-based or Kafka-based, or there's, I think there are other possible solutions there, is a pretty interesting topic that you could spend a lot of time on. By the way, I'm curious, like uh, Steve, you mentioned about some people use MQTT, some use uh, Kafka. I I'd like to hear your thoughts, like uh, in general, what, what are copy bars seeing those two. Like even Kafka can support, like if you build a connector, you can support the general MQTT protocol as well. Right. So, yeah, uh, well, I think some of the challenges are land, you know, to feed it into one of these kind of standardized, standardized um, event flows or time series data, you've, you're generally going to have to run, load some kind of a app down at the origination point. And I think some of these vary in, in how resource intensive landing that initial publication point is. So that could be, there might be a trade-off there where some of these uh, 
platforms give you more features, but at the cost of more resource consumption. Uh, some yeah. of them may or may not be uh, as tolerant as others with regard to intermittent network uh, connectivity and performance too. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I think that that's one of the reasons why I think MQTT is sometimes favored or even message queuing protocols like, I don't know, RabbitMQ or things in that family uh, can be favored because of the ability to queue things uh, when network connectivity is intermittent. Mm -hmm. There's also, uh, I've been doing a lot of work recently with uh, very large uh, message payloads, uh, i.e. like video and image frames, which are not really well suited to anything except the lowest overhead possible. Uh -huh. And so uh, any, any pub sub system, while beautiful, needs to probably step aside in that scenario because the video frames at 60 frames a second are, are very difficult to, uh, to queue and deliver. So you should really just allow someone to tap them. Uh, mm -hmm. So, which, you know, there's just, there's a mix of use cases and there's a right architecture for, uh, you know, 20% and, you know, another right architecture for 30%. And the, the question is, is should they all be one thing? Should they all be orchestratable in the same way? Maybe, maybe not, right? And I don't think that it's right to say that there's an answer at this stage of edge computing, but what there should be is a lot of exploration. Right. And I think there's my days in device IoT uh, at Wonderware bring me back to your, your point of things being different. The two use cases of uh, sensor readings, IoT and video are such that I believe that the common ask then isn't that these things be queued indefinitely. You'd rather throw it away and get the fresher data. You know, you, I care about what the temperature of this vessel is now, not what it was five minutes ago if my connection got interrupted. So when the connection comes back, I don't want you to start with five minute old data in favor of what it is now. Same thing with security video. You know, yep. at a certain point, the, the stale stuff isn't what you care about. You want the live feed. That's right. In fact, it's 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 uh, it's so useless that you can drop it on the floor after a certain amount of time because your the actions you would take are not actions that would produce good results. So you'd rather have no yeah. data than, than video that's too old or sensor readings that are too old. That's right. And I found that some of these legacy protocols that were built for traditional IoT applications try to re-logo themselves as edge appropriate but just don't have the best behavior for some of these use cases when they you know, relentlessly try for perfection rather than giving a mechanism to simply pitch out the old stuff. Yeah. Can you, can you give a, a specific example of, uh, of that kind of behavior? Well, you know, I did a protocol for industrial IoT. I'm dating myself, but it goes back all the way to the 90s and we ended up pitching out the use of TCP as a protocol just because it had that behavior of having a lot of queuing built into the protocol, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, doing retries to the point where when things resolved, you were getting stale data rather than what you really cared about. You know, that's a much lower level of the protocol stack. And some of these message things are even a layer above that. But if they ride on TCP, inherently, even at the layer below, you've got potential issues. Yeah, yeah, that's it. totally makes sense. Yeah, most most of the protocols we uh, that are widely used right now are, are rather uh, dependent on UDP or something that would be UDP-like in in nature. Mm -hmm. Certainly not TCP. Yeah, and and the specific application I was working on were control panels for human operators in factories and process plants where they would be, you know, at these big consoles controlling a factory, a pipeline. And if there's disruptions in the connectivity to their sensors, uh, you really don't want five minute old data. Oh, uh, gosh. Especially yes. if it, you know, initially causes an operator to think that it's the current state of things when that isn't reality. Horrible things can happen with that. And, uh, you know, it, those were early days of resolving some of these issues, but the problem is still there. And I think that 
there are circumstances where with, I don't know, financial transactions or something where you'd be really concerned about that. Even like smart cities where somebody feeds a credit card number into a parking meter, uh, you don't want that to be lost. So queuing would be favored for that, yet it's yeah. still an edge application. But certain other things, the queuing is not a feature, it's a flaw. Yep. Yes. And to, to add one more layer to it, I know that we're, we're out of time, but um, now if you are gonna drop stuff on the floor, do you need a lightweight audit trail to tell that you've dropped data on the floor until the one that you delivered? And if you don't drop data on the floor, do you need an audit trail saying that it has in fact delivered all of the messages? And so in what way do you really want the edge to be accountable for the data flows uh, in order to be able to um, settle accounts and things like that? Uh, the main reason that I bring it up is if you can imagine doing some artificial intelligence or data analytics on some sensor or video data that arrived and it was in fact five minutes old, um, but it was, you know, uh, there was some flaw in the system, you would want that recorded to know that you issued a parking ticket for someone based on old information that arrived five minutes late. So that way, at least when you audit you know, you're not saying, well, that's what the system reported, right? The more autonomous we try to make the world, the more record keeping we probably need to do uh, to be able to uh, uh, shore up unfairness and things like that. So it's a whole nother deep topic of, uh, you know, distributed audit trail. Okay, last call, we've gone an hour. Anybody else want to make a last minute comment or we'll close this down? Uh, one thing I want to mention is about the survey. Uh, we list out a survey question for the KubeCon Europe in August. So we like to like submit the survey soon. So please go there. I share the link in our Slack. Um, would uh, like to hear your thoughts and put your inputs there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe put it again in the Slack if you didn't just do it, just so that people don't have to scroll back and find mm -hmm. it. That would be great. I'm really not, I don't use Slack every day. Maybe I can follow up with you how, how to put okay. it. Yeah. And uh, I apologize to Tina if uh, we were supposed to have you on the agenda for a, a Crano. We don't have time to this time, but uh, we'll roll that into a future meeting. Uh, you can let me know whether you'd prefer the uh, Eastern Europe, Asia time cycle or this one. Either one works. Okay. Okay, I'll put you in the next meeting and that's in a couple of weeks. Yeah, sure. All right. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for attending. And uh, there's a two, week, two weeks from now, there's a meeting on the Asia time cycle four weeks from now on this at this time. Thank you. Yeah. Talk to Thank you, you guys. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.